you saying that us as storytellers, screenwriters, we give, we have an impact on an emotional level. Absolutely. And on an intellectual level or meaning level. Absolutely. Um, sometimes, once in a while, you, you also create really deep moments of, of transformative viewing or high meaning. I mean, very often when we watch movies, they, they, they come in through to our mind and then just go away. But sometimes, and this would be interesting for every scriptwriter and every director, when this deep meaning happens, when things are getting huge and the impact is taking place, something is happening, and what is happening in that moment? So that actually has been my focus in the research. What is actually happening when people are open, glued to the screen, when, when, when they are completely immersed, they, they forget they are sitting in the movie, they are in the story. What is happening? What is the condition of that situation? I very much like the fact of seeing you know, both approach. Immersion is what, is what we are obsessed with as screenwriters. Uh, how to immerse the spectator and how to see first of all the different types of immersion and how to make it uh, work. Uh, means that we uh, identify what are this, uh, how it works in the spectator's body. And, uh, and this is a taboo, by the way. So for, it's, it's a subject that screenwriters very rarely uh, study or talk about in a, in a substantial way. So I, I can't wait to see how you would um, describe the immersion phenomenon with your two different perspectives. We should clarify that uh, emotion and cognition are not two different things. They are the same space. And number two, that uh, lots is going on on a subconscious way, on a non-conscious way um, that people cannot access to. And when they have then to explain what's going on, it's lots of the time it's a fiction. You know about themselves, of what about what you know they uh, they might consider uh, uh, consistent uh, with what they they feel or think. Is immersion a <coughs> conscious level or unconscious level for you? Immersion in a fiction world for a spectator? Well, I think that if immersion occurs, it's by definition because people lose control. You know they don't know where they are anymore, and they are really swallowed by what is going on on the screen. And, uh, and they, 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 they lose, you know, uh, they lose track of, of, of many different things, what is in the environment, in the room, uh, other people and so on. Otherwise, they are not immersed anymore. So there will be um, the way people talk about how they're immersed and how they're immersed concretely in reality. And, and this can at, be- At two different times. Yeah. Because you, you cannot speak about what you are doing while you are immersed. You can only, you know, try to re-understand later what uh, happen, happened to you, you know, later on, because you cannot do both at the same time. Um, I, I agree a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you could also talk about altered states of consciousness. Uh, when you are immersed, you enter into a new mood, altered states of consciousness, as, as one expression of that. Uh, and when I was doing interviews, uh, I, I sometimes sensed that deep, I agree, the deep unconscious processes were going on. So, so in some cases, when, when people were glued to the screen, they, they really didn't know what was going on. They were captured by a scene. They were dragged into to the scene from very deep reasons, uh, sources that, that they didn't know about. Uh, some cases, you, you could talk about that, um, getting into a hypnotic, hypnotic mode or, or something like that, a meditate, meditative mode. But uh, uh, one controversy in the study that I was doing, that when I tried to understand to be glued to the screen, was that it was not, not only when you were, were immersed, it was also when you were engaged with, with your full cognitive capacity of interpreting life, high meaning. So it was a combination with 
arousal and, and engagement in the story, but also processing what was going on with the highest abstract thinking level possible for, for the viewers. And that was actually interesting because some others of the, of the film scholars, they, they, they were surprised that I added this. Higher meaning is also going on when you are glued to the screen. It's not only, but that is actually my, my, my theoretical contribution. So usually you talk about to be glued to the screen, to be unconsciously immersed. But my adding was, no, not only. It's also when you consider the development in the world, the, the, the climate change or the political situation, you are engaged also with your full capacity of thinking together. And that's why I make this distinction between arousal and effect and also high cognition. When this is combined, you get this full thinking. And, and my, my suggestion for that that situation is thick viewing, that it's, it's extremely much going on from basic affect to, to high cognition. So that's the, my way to, to understand it's a range of going, uh, things going on in the viewer, engaging the, the full capacity of, of experiencing and thinking. So you have uh, different layers. You have a, uh, an immersion that's kind of oniric. Like, uh, with a dreamlike quality, yes. where you lose yourself, uh, where exactly. you get lost, and the other one, which is quite the opposite, uh, where you are so concerned about what you see, that it engages your um, full um, intellectual capacity and moral too. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Because what you said uh, about moral evalu evaluation, I think is uh, very central to um, what makes a viewer uh, connect with what he sees on screen. It's not only engaged, uh, is, um, is um, taken as a judge, as a witness, and uh, he has to judge what's on screen. I, I don't know about that, really, because you have immersion like a dreamlike, and yes. immersion when you're asked to think something about what you see. It's, it's quite different. So uh, is it possible to explain um, how you can connect to both layers? Because obviously, when somebody is writing, he wants to have all the layers um, yes. connected. Maybe we could answer your your question, but I, I just wanted to to make sure that uh, you are you are making a hierarchy among you know the different processing. That means there are effects at the very bottom, and you know, yeah. and you put you know higher order th uh, thought processing, um, uh, conscious processing at the top. There is no such thing in cognitive science today. You know, there is a web of different. Uh, processing, contributing, you know, to the way we, at the end of the day, capture the world. And again, there is a very long tradition, uh, and I guess the philosopher can help us in this regard. And uh, Descartes, I think, was putting uh, some kind of uh, uh, judgmental uh, 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 evaluation of emotions versus reasoning, for instance. An emotion is of a lower uh, uh, um, value because it creates mess, it creates uh, you know, disorder, whereas thought is putting together some order. But this is not the case. You know, emotions do guide cognition. That means threat, to be worried, you know, is a very good piece of information because if you are worried or if you are afraid, you should flee because there is something you know, dangerous going on. So without fear, you, know, you don't think properly. So there is no uh, kind of hierarchy uh, between these different uh, type of, of, of cognitions. That's number one. Uh, and number two, when, you, when we speak about uh, being immersed and uh, uh, being able to think about what's going on, it's what you call metacognitive you know, attitude, is being able you know, to judge the content of our own cognitions, you know, this is a very slow processing. It cannot take place at the same time. There is constantly a, a metacognitive judgment. You know, when yeah. I'm sitting uh, in, in, uh, in a dark room and, and viewing a, f a movie, there is constantly something saying, do I like it? Do I enjoy it? Uh, 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 will it last longer? And so on and so forth. Uh, there is some kind of uh, implicit uh, uh, um, uh, metacognitive uh, processing. But it cannot take place exactly uh, at the same time, at least at the conscious level. 
because if you want to be able you know to verbalize you know to to to, to have declarative uh, uh, utterance about what's going on uh, it, it cannot be you know at the same time uh, that that uh, you, that you do that and now we, you spoke about the third concept which is moral judgment and moral judgment is very quick it's amazing you know uh, how and we can see that with children this has been uh, discussed for a long time for the last 50 or 60 years at least from Piaget um, that uh, even very young children or I would say even all the more, you know, young children have a very quick moral judgment um, and, and uh, you are shocked by a scene. You are immediately, without, you know, having to process the information, uh, decide whether this is acceptable or if it's shocking. And uh, filmmakers do play a lot with these kind of things because they are yep. very good at some point are putting things in a certain way so that it becomes unacceptable and if you put it in a, uh, with another angle it becomes you know somehow uh, more nuanced so uh, i would say that um, uh, this issue of moral uh, uh, judgment is again very automatic and it would be very easy you know to show you some some uh, i would say uh, some stories that you would very quickly judge uh, morally acceptable or not acceptable without having to think and being even unable to explain why you would think you know this is acceptable or unacceptable. Yes, I, I agree with the, the main picture you're, you're describing because I've also been reading Antonio Damasio and his way to, to when, when our moral thinking is, is anchored in our complete body, we are, we are physical, physical beings. But still, for, for understanding uh, arousal, for example, when, you're, when you see uh, something on the screen uh, and you are a little bit shocked or excited or aroused, um, it is interesting to, to make this uh, separation between uh, uh, hierarchy in, in thinking, I think, that, that is uh, relevant. So I think it's useful to talk about the moral judgment. If you see a person rushing into a room, then uh, it's important, is this the good guy or is it the bad guy? So you immediately, in, in the glimpse of a second, you, you, you interpret this as, is this the good one or the bad one? And, if you, and that's a moral judgment with your, your frontal cortex. So I, I think it's, it's valid to talk about that because that, depending on, on what you see and how you interpret that person, it affects your, your emotional evaluation of him. Oh, this is the good one. So now, now, now we see what's happening. And, and the, the, the arousal get the content. And obviously, it's, it's always related to a question about survival. You know, uh, we are in a community and, uh, and we are very, very much social uh, actors. And at the end of the day, uh, you, you have, you know, uh, to think about the well-being of the community uh, and to take a decision uh, which, uh, at the end of the day, uh, maximizes, you know, the uh, well-being of your community. So would you say that for a screenwriter, for example, building a dilemma would be a way to engage the reader, the viewer, spectator, let's say, in a very quick way, on a moral level. And, and if it's a dilemma, I would say that it, that becomes very interesting in terms of uh, screenwriting, because then there is no, you know, definitive decision. You know, there is, and, and, you, and, you, and you get, you know, the spectator or the viewer in some kind of, uh, uh, of uh, moral maze uh, and with no strict uh, uh, immediate uh, decision and then you have a story because then you can develop otherwise you know the story is already finished. Real life, real life is not the story but when we enter into the, the filmmaking we, we are entering into a created universe so I think there is a, a huge difference between the real dilemma of life situations when, when Maybe the tram look, looks at, sees some, some pattern, it's a child or something like that, and then it changes the, the decision. I agree with that. It's, it's, it's not, it's instinct. But when we enter into the, the, the storytelling, we enter into the constructed 
and moral universe. That's, that's the interesting way. That's why we engage so much, because it, it invites us to think about constructed and life relevant situations. But there is a difference. Some, some people, they, they relate only to the storytelling. They are into the intratext. They, they are just trying to, to, to get the, the, the story. What is happening and, and how is the ending and, and what is the narrative. But some, and, and some people in the audience, they, are, they, they stop there. But some people are also taking what is the, the meaning for the larger life. So they jump from the fiction, from the intratext, and they go to real life situation and make conclusions about, ah, this is the way life should be. So it, it, it's all a construction when you talk to people. They, they, they go from fiction and they go to their moral reasoning. Oh, life should be like, more like this. For, uh, Amelie, from, for example, if, believe if, if the life was more like, like she was acting in the world. Oh, it would be a wonderful world. Um, and, and, and I think there is a, a, a sharp distinction between real situation when you decide and, and, and people who decide wrong, they, they can feel guilt for years after because they didn't live up to their moral standards. So there is a difference when you go from, from the storytelling and the narrative mood uh, to real life. I think that is... Uh, Maybe in connection with what you just said, uh, to go back to uh, how a screenwriter uh, understands his mission you know, to take uh, humans on board. Uh, uh, what is interesting here is that it's very close to a problem we often have working on scripts, is the need to avoid explanation. You know, when when you go into uh, because often writers tend to be uh, wanting to explain what is happening and explain what they want the viewer to think, but whenever they start to explain, they disconnect the immersive process. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, that's interesting because uh, here it means if you want to, the immersion to be on, it means that you cannot talk to the brain. You have to talk to some other part, which goes back to the description of immersion. You know, how does this proceed? You know, uh, uh, what, what, are the, 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 uh, what are the parts of the body that are pushed, triggered, moved? You know, uh, everything we live goes through the brain. There is no other way. Mm -hmm. It goes through the nervous system. Mm -hmm. So you can have captures in your body and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, everything has to be, to be processed by the brain. So that's, uh, that's number one. And explaining is obviously uh, uh, contradictory to uh, being attractive to the, to the viewer. Because you speak to his mind uh, in a way which is purely rational or purely declarative. Declarative means verbal, you know, that means that uh, they are, if images are too straightforward at the end of the day, uh, you make a speech uh, which is so clear that at the end of the day there is no space for interpretation uh, and that becomes very boring. Um, so the fact is that uh, um, explaining will immediately cut, you know, the viewer from any kind of uh, uh, direct contact with uh, images or situations, I would say. From experience. From experience, from, yeah. Mm. From direct experience, yeah. Uh, what I hear uh, from both of you is that uh, the quickest way to engage um, a viewer is uh, both emotions and moral evaluation. This is what you call moral evaluation, but in a way cognition is already in emotions. And you were talking about Descartes. Descartes in his book, The Treaty of Passions, says that passions, emotions are very useful because uh, they make you react very quickly. And he, and he gives a definition of what a passion is. A passion is fear, it's a joy, it's sadness, it's a despise, disgust, uh, love, desire. Uh, so all the passions that we use, you talked about nine affects, I'd like you to define them. Um, and he says, for example, fear, is um, deformation of reality because, because what you are afraid of is bigger in your mind 
than it is in reality. But this is a useful deformation because it makes you go away quicker. So um, Descartes says that emotions and passions especially are very useful uh, for survival and uh, for storytelling. Uh, what I feel is that when you see something on screen, you know it's not for real. So you're not here to survive. You're not going to uh, fly away from the theater. You're here to stay. So you know it's uh, fake, but because it's fake, you feel free. No? So to, to experience um, passions, but in a different way than uh, the connection to survival. And I feel that a script writer is here to be very playful. And he says, OK, we're going to play with your passions, with your emotions. You're going to feel as if you have to run away. I guess, why do you go to watch Titanic? Because you know you're the one with the ticket for a free ride that uh, gives you the guarantee that you will be back home safely. You'll be afraid, but it's not for real. No? So there is this distinction between real life and fiction, um, which uh, makes you very happy to feel the, the usual passions, but without the, the real danger. No? And what I learned from both of you today is that you can connect those very quick responses that we call passions, you can connect it with moral judgment. Moral judgment, we think it's uh, like a trial, that it takes time. No, and you say this is a split millisecond. And this is fascinating for a scriptwriter to hear that, because that means that you can connect the basic uh, passions and the moral judgment, they're as quick. Uh, all of them are they're as quick as each other. There's no hierarchy in speed, mm -hmm. you know? So I would say that uh, fiction is, is really relating to this deep capacity that we have, we, that we have to consider true some things which are purely fiction. That's number one. And number two, I would say that uh, relates to the fact that I'm not always safe when I'm, when I'm in front of a screen. Uh, uh, some, some pictures can be very, uh, um, I would say, um, uncomfortable and, uh, and very threatening. And I can carry them for a very, very long time because it revives you know, some deep you know, uh, uh, fears that I have, and it nourishes uh, uh, th these fears. So we have to maybe be careful of, of these two things. Uh, well, th there is this uh, Dolf Silman, American psychologist. He, he, he made an experiment with, with uh, nine-year-old children uh, and also mentally handicapped children. Uh, a simple child story where, where uh, a prince, the good prince and a bad prince. Uh, and uh, the good prince was supposed to, to uh, inherit the, the kingdom, but the bad prince put him in jail and took over the kingdom. And, and he was, the bad prince was very bad. And, and eventually, the story, uh, the, the good prince was helped by some, some uh, loyal servants, and he w went out from the prison, and he could capture the bad prince. Uh, and then he, they created two different endings. Uh, one, when the good prince punished the bad prince uh, very severely, put him on, on, the, on the square, uh, on a pole, and people were spitting at, at him and they were flogging him. A very severe punishment. And then a mild punishment. He, he was uh, sitting uh, some, some, yeah, some week in jail, and then he was accepted back in the family. So the, the good prince was benevolent to, towards the bad prince. And then uh, a completely neutral, nothing happened. And the children, the nine-year-old children, would, would happen to start to, to evaluate things. They liked the mild punishment most. Um, and they disliked the severe punishment. So th there is actually... Some, some process going on. So, so you really relate and enjoy. That's, that's why, why this is interesting, is that your, your euphoria, your, your engagement, and your, your likening of the story depends on a, a, a delicate balance of, of good and bad punishments. But the mentally retarded, or what you call it, the, 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 the handicapped children, they could not differentiate between the very severe punishment and the mild punishment. So they lacked this capacity of differentiate between. So they were equally joyful when the good prince behaved very badly. So, but, but the ordinary viewer are actually very sensitive for this. 
So if something, if the good guy does something that is far out of, of the, the moral reasoning and the, the, the moral standard that the audience had, people re withdraw from the movie. No, that is not okay. So that, now he's not a good guy anymore. So I withdraw from the protagonist because the, the sanction he's, he's, he's doing is, is unacceptable. And that is very interesting because you, you dwell, when you, people are, are deep, deeply moved by movies, it's also this. It, it, it takes aboard the, the complete uh, reasoning of life. So, so I insist there is a moral reasoning in the movies. And the other thing is probably fiction as a very good uh, uh, role, which is not to feed people with, you know, their expectations, but again, probably, you know, to contradict what uh, uh, should be expected. And a, a movie is not interesting if, you know, the, the better situation occurs or the expected situation occurs. Uh, a movie is probably attractive because at some point you just uh, <coughs> do what is not supposed to happen. And for instance, the prince becomes very cruel. You know, yeah. uh, he, he should be benevolent. But, you know, at the end of the day, there is a real story because at the end of the day, this prince uh, uh, is doing something uh, very unacceptable and how, you know, this thing uh, will, will develop from this uh, starting point. So it seems that what you're saying maybe is that a screenwriter has to anticipate the anticipation of, of the audience, of the viewer. He has to take that in, in consideration to know that he has an impact and he builds an anticipation in a way. And it's not neutral. That's very interesting because a screenwriter is a human being. So he plays by the same ru uh, rules. He has is uh, the same kind of moral, uh, 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 I would say, uh, uh, architecture. He has the same kind of set of uh, universal emotional uh, uh, feelings and so on and so forth. So uh, he is uh, constantly, uh, uh, I would say, um, uh, yes, uh, nourished by his own uh, humanity. I would say. I think that is completely correct. I think that's a good way to put it, that, that the scriptwriters and directors and, and, uh, and novelists, they are actually part of the same reality. They are swimming in the same ocean as, as the audience. They are trying to capture something going on. And that's why it's so interesting. I mean, it's very difficult to make a movie. It's very difficult to create a story that, that resonates, that echoes what is going on. Sometimes a film comes from nowhere and just taps into the, the contemporary consciousness. For example, Matrix 1999. Who would imagine this strange, curbed, philosophical film would actually become that success? They, they managed to tap into something. Or Amélie from Montmartre. How, how could you imagine that that a bizarre, humoristic, uh, high-tempo film would actually connect to so many people? So, and that's why it's so, so difficult. So, so sometimes it happens. But it's, it's a creative process from, from both sides. I mean, the scriptwriter is, is a creative person. But so is the viewer as well. And, and that was one of the biggest surprises for me when I was interviewing people that was the, the creative leaps they did from a story to their own life. And the most drastic example was, I was interviewing one guy about Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. The ending, when, when, when Aragorn is standing out of Mordor, without hope they will be destroyed in one minute if, if Frodo doesn't manage to, to drop the, the, the ring in, in, in the, the volcano. And suddenly they were just standing there, facing death. And suddenly this miracle happens and, and uh, Mordor goes down. So that was his key scene when he was the most engaged. And then I asked him, what do you think about that scene? And, and how does it relate to your life? And he said, well, you know, I'm a young father and I am standing in the, in the doorway in the morning and I'm trying to get my children to, to kindergarten and I have one minute left. And how could I manage to get them to the kindergarten, to, to get clothes and things like that? Then I, it's an impossible situation. <laughs> like Aragon and the Mordor. 
So he made this jump from Lord of the Rings, the, the chaos and, and the cosmic battle between good and evil, to the situation on his doormat with his children. A giant leap. <laughs> So it's a very creative and surprising jump that, that people make from, from one scene to their own life. It's impossible to imagine the, the, the way people are actually. To, and that's, that's, I think that is a, from a theoretical point of view is, is very interesting because uh, people are metaphorically using a scene, translating it into their life. To life. Mm and in, in, in completely unpredictable ways. And that's also why some films are actually success. They, 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 they tap into something and people, the viewers, creative viewers are actually taking it to their heart and using it for different reasons. And they are deeply moved. Uh, and it, you have to ask them, why? What, why is it relevant for you? And then, then they, they can also answer if you're sensitive enough. But in order to generate that kind of process, which is a fascinating process, we all agree, we all dream of generating exactly. stories that can generate that. But in order to generate that, you need step one to be established, which means immersion to be there. That kind of process never happens if the viewer doesn't feel immersed. You know I guess, I guess not, I guess not. I mean, you all, all people look for impact. And that, that's the first question. How do you actually impact and get people to, to come to the movie and to, to get involved? If, I don't know, uh, well, I use immersion and deeply moved and, and uh, glued to the screen a little bit like synonyms, to be glued to the screen, immersed into the story. There are two things here that I find interesting. Number one, uh, uh, you said, uh, should the sc screenwriter be aware of what, uh, uh, how the, the viewer would be reacting? And what we just said, it's, it's very unpredictable. So that means that there are these recipes you know, to create uh, this kind of, uh, uh, of um, uh, interest uh, by the viewer. This maybe we can discuss later. Uh, number two, do we, re do we really need to be immersed, to be touched by a movie. For instance, I remember by Amélie, in Amélie Poulain, uh, you, you, I think you keep control, you are just, um, it's so poetic, it's so new, that you don't feel in your own world, you, know, you, you are in another world, uh, and you just uh, uh, are just uh, um, fascinated by the way these people live uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, access uh, to the world. So probably you are not always immersed when you are touched and uh, emotionally or intellectually. Um, but it depends on how you define, define immersion. Immersed. Because the, the, for, for, for us, we would define as screenwriters immersion as being exactly what you said, which is being taken into you know, the screen, the situation, etc. Which is, are we... Uh, are we looking at it as observers or are we looking at it as people that are, in, that are uh, you know, droning in that sea, you know, that are completely taken into that water? You know? and, and I think we have a, a divided audience. Some are trained and, and have this distanced viewing of, of complex filmmaking, avant-garde art film. So th th there are two kinds of film, if you make it simple. Uh, commercial films, uh, mainstream storytelling, and these very uh, arty films. And you have also different audiences. The, the experience you talked about with young children, uh, with the good prince and the yeah. bad prince, maybe we could uh, think that an audience, if it's young, maybe it's not the same experience when it's uh, more adult, and you have adult movies or series, for example, the beginning of A House of Cards, it starts with something that you're not supposed to do with a character, you see him kill a dog. So it's kind of very uh, um, uh, anti-hero, but this is what connects you uh, with what you look at. and. Uh, you were making a distinction between emotion that would immerse uh, you and distance, which would, would be ironic. But some emotions include distance, for example, disgust, 
yeah. uh, or hate. Yeah. If you hate watch something, you watch it. If you watch something with disgust, you watch it and you watch a disgusting character go deeper and deeper in the moral uh, uh, situations. For example, Breaking Bad, it keeps getting worse and worse and this is why you look at it. It's like a car crash on, on the road. You're not supposed to look at it and this is why you look at it. So I think we should make a distinction between the moral values we have as uh, human beings and the moral adventure we promise as script writers. And the script writer has to go uh, in places where you're not allowed to go in real life. For example, Godfather, when you write about Godfather, it doesn't mean that you are going to be a mafia boss or that you are going to justify the killing of your brother. Of course not. And this is why everybody's looking at it. You know, so we have to, um, as script writers, be, be very confident in the fact that we have to put our moral values on the side precisely to explore what's uh, forbidden usually. And, uh, and I think this is a way to glue and to immerse the, the viewer because he's going to feel shocked. And when you are shocked, you feel strong emotions like fear or you feel afraid or maybe it's dangerous uh, to feel connected to that character. But it's a danger with a safety because it's a fiction. And in, at the end of the day, as you say, you come back to your real life. But what you say is that people take that as a metaphor and as a, a situation they can relate to in their real life. So even if you look at uh, Aragorn or Frodo or Gollum or Harry Potter, Potter or Voldemort, or whatever, you're going to make a connection because it's going to be in your um, um, psychic library. And uh, exactly. it's like a reference you can use to adapt to your world. And uh, I think this is a very strong message to give to the people who write and to create stories. Uh, everybody's going to use whatever they write as a metaphor and as a real situation um, that they're going to live as a dream, but maybe to learn how to live and how to live better. So there's a connection to make and there's a strong separation to make. And if you are creating a story, you have to go deep, which means far from the social um, accepted values. So it's like moral adventure. <laughs> <laughs>